<laughs> and I appreciate it, I guess. Did you have a good Thanksgiving? Yeah? Uh, just, do you, feel, do you feel like, not that anybody said this to you, do you just feel like, eh, I might have eaten just a little too much? Anybody? Thank you. Thank you for confessing along with me. I did as well. Those of you who didn't have your hands up, there's lots of room during our response time this morning. I'm just kidding. I hope you had a good time. I hope that, that uh, you were safe. I hope that, uh, that you did take time to be thankful, to be mindful of, of um, just all the things that God has blessed us with. Here's my next question, though. How many of you, let's be honest, how many of you already had Christmas decorations up before Thanksgiving? Anybody? Okay, that's all right. No judgment. No judgment here. How many of you, uh, as soon as the leftovers were put away, the decorations were up? How many of you still have decorations to get up? There, okay, all right. That's good. All right. Christmas time is coming, right? And I'm excited about that. It's one of my favorite holidays, one of my favorite uh, times of year. I love spending this time of year with family and with, with my church family. But uh, even though we're going to start next Sunday, just spoiler alert, starting next Sunday, we're starting a new series called Stories from the Stable. Stories from the Stable. And I want you to invite people to come and be along with that, be, be with us uh, for that whole series. Uh, and we're going to talk about the, the, the story of the birth of Jesus. We're going to celebrate that together. We're going to talk about the stable that he was born in and all the different things that we can, that we can learn and experience from that story together. So please mark down your calendars. Come join us. Bring other people with you. But today... We're going to be cheerful one more time. We're going to be cheerful. We're going to put smiles on our faces. We're going to be cheerful, right? Yes. All right. Let's be cheerful this morning. Now, just to give you an idea of what we've been talking about, in case you haven't been with us or in case you forgot, we've been talking about being cheerful. That's coming from a scripture that we read in Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 15. And so if you've got your Bibles, you can open there. It's in the Old Testament, about halfway through the Old Testament, the book of Proverbs. All these wise sayings from Solomon and a couple of other guys. Um, but Solomon says in, in Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 15 that all the days of the oppressed are wretched, but the cheerful heart has a continual feast. And we've, we've talked about, so I don't want to spend a whole lot of time reiterating the point, but we talked about how we have bad days. We have oppressed days. We have days that, that feel wretched, that just feel miserable. And Solomon's point is that it, it, he's not saying that if you're a good person, if you're a godly person, that you never have days like that, that you have some kind of, of protective shield that keeps you from ever having days like that. His point is that even when, even when I have a miserable day, even when things aren't going the way that they're supposed to, even when people mistreat me and, and treat me in ways that I don't deserve, even when I've made bad choices and I'm dealing with the consequences of those choices, even when things seem to be falling apart, if my heart is cheerful, it's the same as having a feast. The joy that you felt when you put that mouthful of stuffing in your face earlier this week is the same joy you can feel on a regular basis if you have a connection relationship with God. And if you choose to find ways to be cheerful in the ways that God describes. And so we've been talking about that for the last few weeks. What it looks like to have a cheerful heart. What it looks like to be cheerful in the way that God calls us to be cheerful. We talked about being a cheerful giver and, and letting go of the things we have and, and sharing those things with others and having an attitude that's not my stuff anyway. It's stuff that God has given me, and I'm just going to share that with whoever needs it. And how we can, we can uh, be joyful in letting go of the things that sometimes we cling a little too tightly to. We talk, well, I guess we didn't really talk about it. We, we put our, our words into actions, and we, we cleared the chairs out of the way. We had tables out here, and we strapped on the hairnets, and we packed 51,000 meals for hung, hungry people. And, and, and we were cheerful as we did it. We, we had cheerful service. where We recognized we have the gifts and the abilities to do something for someone who can't do those things for themselves, and we did it. And we challenge each other, let's go do this on a regular basis. Not necessarily pack meals on a regular basis, although that would probably be a good thing. But let's find ways to meet people's needs all around us. And put a smile on our face as we do it. We talked uh, last week about cheerful endurance. About how to, how to have a godly attitude and a cheerful heart when things are going bad. How to get through on the other side of those things. How to persevere. How to keep moving forward in spite of difficult circumstances. And this morning, this morning I want to remind us of, of one of the things that, that keeps us 
from experiencing joy in our daily journey. Something that, that robs many of us of joy. Something that consistently uh, uh, keeps us from, from feeling cheerful, from being cheerful in the way God calls us to be. And it's not, it's not just when someone hurts or mistreats us, but rather when we hold on to that hurt. See if I can explain that a little better. It is completely natural when someone does something hurtful to me to feel hurt. When someone treats me in a mean way, I am allowed. God has given me the emotions to deal with that. I can feel anger. I can feel sadness. I can feel depression. I can feel frustration. I can feel resentment. It's, it's completely natural for me to have those emotions and those feelings when someone does something hurtful to me or to somebody that I care about. But the problem is when I hold on to those feelings, when I cling to my frustration, when I cling to my resentment, when I cling to my anger, when I hold on to those things or allow those things to hold on to me, when, when, I, when I choose to retaliate, when I choose to hold a grudge, when I, when I choose to be resentful, when I choose to, to even get other people to get on my side and feel bad about those people who treated me bad. When I have that kind of heart, when that kind of attitude, man, that, that, that ends up weighing me down. It, it, it steals my peace. It robs me of my joy. And that's what I want to talk about this morning experiencing or, or maybe better yet showing cheerful forgiveness cheerful forgiveness and you may be thinking to yourself okay well what does that look like and and I, I i guess it's easy for us to talk about maybe forgiveness in a church setting we're supposed to be forgiving people right people do something to hurt us People say something against us. People do something to hurt somebody that we care about. And we can talk about forgiveness and grace, and we're supposed to be forgiving. But let's be honest. All right, maybe uh, I shouldn't put it on you. I'll put it on me. Sometimes when I forgive other people, it is through my gritting teeth. I don't forgive you. Or in my heart, I forgive you because God says I have to, but mm, I don't really want to. We need to move beyond that kind of heart and that kind of attitude when we forgive and show grace to other people. Let me show you why. A few weeks ago, when we were talking about being a cheerful giver, we looked at this verse in the New Testament from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and verse 7. Where the Apostle Paul says, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. If you, I, if, if you were with us a, a few weeks ago, you remember us talking about this, what it means to be a cheerful giver. And we talked about how in the original language that, that this scripture was written in, in, the, in that original ancient Greek language, that the word that we translate in our English Bibles is cheerful, that word carried with it a, a connotation of being so excited about whatever activity it is that, that I have the opportunity to, partic to participate in, that I'm convinced it's something I want to be a part of, and, and, I'm, and I'm convinced it's something that needs to be done, and I'm just excited about the opportunity to do it. That's what that word, that's... That's the weight that that word carries. So when Paul says you need to be a cheerful giver, he says, he's saying you need to be so convinced that giving, that letting go of your stuff and giving to somebody else or giving towards something that's going to do some good for someone, you need to be so convinced of how right that is and how necessary that is and how needful it is for you to be a part of that you can't wait to, to give. You can't wait to be a part of that. That's the kind of heart you need to have when you give. A cheerful giver is someone who gives gladly because they're convinced that it's the right thing to do, that God's going to do something with their gift. Someone who chooses to give, someone who looks forward to giving, someone who enjoys giving because it needs to be done. Y'all with me? Okay. Now, if you got your Bibles open or your Bible apps, go back a few books to the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 12, same author, the, author uh, the Apostle Paul is writing. And in chapter 12, he's given a list in the middle of chapter 12 about here's some different, here's some different acts of service. Here's some different things that, that Christians need to be a part of. And he talks about preaching, and, and he talks about leading, and he talks about encouraging, and he talks about giving, and he talks about the heart and the attitude that we need to have those things with. And in verse 8, as he's going through this list, or Romans chapter 12, in verse 8 he says, if it's to encourage 
then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, to do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it how? Cheerfully. Let's say that a little louder. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Let's say it loud with a smile on our face like we are cheerful. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. cheerfully. Yes. Guess what? In the original Greek language, this is the same word that Paul uses in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 when he talks about what giving needs to look like. But here he says, if it's to show mercy, if it's to show grace, if it's to show forgiveness, if it's to keep from giving people the punishment they deserve, do it how? Cheerfully. In other words, do it willingly. Be so convinced that it's the right thing to do that you can't wait to do it. Be so convinced that this person needs to experience grace and forgiveness and acceptance that you are, you're in a desperate to make it happen. And you do it with a smile on your face, not gritting your teeth, not under compulsion like he talked about in 2 Corinthians with giving, but, but freely, openly. I can't wait to forgive this person. I can't wait to, to not worry about retaliating. I can't wait to not worry about consequences. I'm going to let this go. I'm going to, I'm going to forgive them. I'm not going to hold this against them. I'm not going to talk bad about them. I'm not going to feel bad about them. I am completely letting this go and setting them free from any kind of retaliation for me. And I'm so excited to do it. How many of us feel that way when people treat us bad? And yet that's what God calls us to do. 2 Corinthians, Paul says, God loves a cheerful giver. Here, Paul could say, God loves a cheerful forgiver. Someone who looks forward to the opportunity to let it go. That doesn't come natural, does it? That's not the easiest thing in the world to do. Maybe one of the most difficult things in the world to do. And, and why would God want that? Why is, why is this what God calls us to be? Why is this the attitude that God calls me to have when I have the opportunity to forgive somebody else? I got a couple of reasons that I want to share with you. Why God wants us to be cheerful forgivers. First of all, cheerful forgiveness, when I, when I forgive people cheerfully, that reminds me that I've been forgiven. It reminds me of, of, of the things that, that God has forgiven me of. The times that I've broken his heart and he said, you know what, it's okay, I still love you anyway. I'm not going to hold this against you. Because of the grace of Jesus, because of the sacrifice on the cross, because of God's love for me, that I've been forgiven of anything that I have done and anything I will ever do. That's amazing. That's why we sing songs and call it Amazing Grace. That's why we just sang a song. This is Amazing Grace. That, that God would look at my life and the, and the choices that I make and the attitudes that I have and, and would forgive all of those things and love me anyway. Folks, I need to... I need to uh, that needs to be the focus of my heart and my mind on a regular, daily basis hourly basis of how awesome and loving my God is. Here's how Paul describes in Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2 beginning in verse 4, he says, because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Paul says, the only reason that we can have salvation through Jesus is because of the love of God. Understand this, folks. When you choose to believe that the story of Jesus is true, when you choose to believe that there is a God, he is alive, he is in heaven, he is reigning right now, he is active and present in this world through his spirit, and he wants to save you from your sins. When you believe all that to be true, and you decide to give your life to Jesus Christ, to ask him into your heart, to make him the king of your life, when you repent of all your sins and say, I don't want to live like this anymore, I don't want to make these choices anymore, I don't want to deal with these consequences anymore, you are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, you are covered in his blood, and you come up a brand new creature, living a brand new life, 
when all that happens, the only reason that happens, the only reason that you have hope of heaven after this life is over and hope of a blessed life while you're here is because God loves you. That's it. If you have never given your life to Jesus Christ, you need to. Because he loves you. If you're sitting here this morning and somebody dragged you here against your will or you had nowhere else to be but you thought, well, I'll come to this church this morning and at least get a cup of coffee and a donut, welcome. We're glad you're here, but I want you to understand that my God loves you. That if you grew up like me where you don't even remember not knowing who God was, not believing in God as you were raised in the church, or you have nothing to do with church and probably have even cursed God a few times. Either way, even if you find yourself somewhere in between those two points, my God loves you. And he sent his only son to die on the cross for you. And the only way that you can get rid of all your sin and all the guilt that comes with it and all the consequences from it is the grace of almighty God. That's awesome. My God has forgiven me. The things that I wish I hadn't done. The things I wish I could do over. The things that uh, I'm not sorry about except that I got caught. The things that I said I'd never do again. And then I said I'd never do it again after that. The things that I hope nobody ever finds out about. The things that I rationalize and say, oh, that's not that big a deal. The things that I try to keep hidden. Maybe even pretend didn't really happen. The things that I do that break my God's heart. The things that, that I do that are completely against who it is that he designed me to be. My God has forgiven all of those. And continues to do so. Not because he has to. Because he chooses to. He just loves me that much. Now Paul says in Colossians chapter 3 keeping that in mind. It says in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 13, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. Understand part of the reason that God wants me to, for, to forgive you and to do it cheerfully, to look forward to the opportunity to forgive you is because in that moment, when I'm extending you grace, when I'm not holding you guilty of the things that you've done to hurt me, even though it's my right, even though you deserve it, and I let go of those things, I don't hold you guilty of those things anymore, I don't hold that stuff over your head, and I don't talk to other people about it, I let it go, I forgive it. In that moment, I'm reminded of what my God has done for me. How much he has let go of on my account. How much he's forgiven me of. We don't need to wallow in guilt. We don't need to forget necessarily what God has forgiven us of. But we don't need to just stay there. We need to be reminded of the times that God has shown us mercy. Reminded of the times that, that God has forgiven us. Because it allows us to be cheerful forgivers ourselves. Another reason cheerful forgiveness is, is important and is why God wants us to do it is, is because cheerful for forgiveness, honestly, it sets me free. Understand, I've, I've been set free because of the blood of Jesus. I've been set free from my sin. I don't have to pay the penalty for my sins anymore because I'm covered in his blood. But when I choose to forgive someone who has hurt me, who has done something to hurt me or some, uh, hurt someone that I care about, when I choose to forgive that, I'm not just... I'm not just releasing you of guilt or of uh, having to suffer consequences or retaliation for me. I'm setting myself free from carrying the burden of resentment around with me. The grudges that I, that I might want to carry, the resentment, the, 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 the anger that I might be holding on to. Those things keep me from being completely free to live the life that God wants me to. Those things keep me from fully experiencing the blessed life that God wants me to have. 
Here's what I mean. I didn't even ask y'all ahead of time. Chance and Griffin, come here. All right. How tall are you, Chance, right now? Six five. Six five. Still growing? Yeah. Maybe. All right. Okay. So this chance, this, this Griffin, and what chance? What I want you to do because you're the taller one, I want you to get on Griffin's back. Okay, you all right? You good? He is tall. His feet are still, his feet are still past your knees. Okay. Now, Griffin, uh, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pretend that um, your shoe's untied. And while Chance is on your back, I want you to kind of try to work on tying your shoe. <laughs> That's talent right there. Excellent. Okay, you're good. Let's pretend that you tied it. Very good. All right, why don't y'all just have a seat in the chair? Your feet are on the ground, man. <laughs> All right, can you stand back up? Okay. You okay? Yeah. All right. Um, man, I could help. I'm, this, this is a perfect opportunity to do all sorts of silly stuff that I'm not going to do. Imagine, now I know a lot of our teenagers go to big schools and they carry 40, 50 pound backpacks on their backs all day going to classes, right? A lot of you do. Okay. But imagine, besides your backpack, imagine carrying Chance around with you at class all day, Griffin. How would that be? Not good. <laughs> <laughs> would it be a hassle? Yes. And get in the way? And people kind of wonder, man, what is wrong with you? <laughs> okay. That's all I need from you. Have a seat. Thank you. Give them a hand. They did a good job. I know this is really simplistic. But what Griffin and Chance just showed us is what we do on a daily basis. When we hold on to resentment and bitterness and hurt feelings towards somebody who has done something for us, we hold on to them. We carry them, we carry whatever it is that we're upset at them for around with us everywhere we go. And it affects our jobs, it affects our attitudes, it affects how we treat our family members. People start to wonder what is wrong with us. It affects our faces. It affects everything about us because we are holding on to our resentment and our anger. And, and it, is, it is a burden. And we could even, I mean, if I gave Griffin the challenge, I would probably have to give some incentive. But if I gave him the challenge, he might spend an entire day almost carrying somebody around on his back because it would be a funny thing to do. By the end of the day, how do you think he's going to feel? Exhausted, tired, sore. Sometimes the reason we are so exhausted and not at peace is because we're not choosing to forgive. And it's weighing us down. It's weighing us down emotionally. It's weighing us down physically. It's weighing us down spiritually. And when I choose to let it go and forgive and say, I'm not going to hold this against you anymore. I'm not just setting that person free. I'm setting myself free from not having to carry that burden anymore. Does that make sense? That's why God wants us to cheerfully forgive. That's why Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 31, get rid of bitterness, get rid of rage, get rid of anger and brawling and slander and every form of malice. Every time you want to take revenge, every time that you want to hold in that grudge, get rid of it. Not just for that person, for you. Be set free from the hurt and the bitterness and the anger so that you can fully experience joy and peace in this life like God wants you to. God wants us to cheerfully forgive because it reminds us of the forgiveness and the grace that we've received from him and it sets us free from having to carry that burden of resentment and anger around anymore. Okay, so how do we do that? I mean, I can say the words, I forgive you, but how, how do I do that? You guys have heard me preach sermons, a lot of you have heard me preach sermons on forgiveness before. So I'm not going to tell you something probably that you haven't heard already. But I want to give you just, just two action steps today to help you in this process. Because it is a process. We can, we can honestly look at somebody and go, I forgive you. And we may not truly have done that even though the words came out of our mouth. 
But truly letting go of the anger and the resentment, that may take a while. That, that doesn't always happen with a snap of our fingers. It takes time and it takes effort and, 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 it, and it takes a lot of just a, 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 an extensive process to get rid of that bitterness and that resentment. So here's a couple things that can help. Number one, choose to forgive. Choose to forgive. We talked last week about, uh, about cheerful endurance, about, about getting through difficult times with a cheerful heart. And we talked about one of the things we have to do is to choose to be cheerful, to choose to endure it, to choose to walk through and keep moving forward. And I know it sounds simplistic, but cheerful forgiveness really comes down to a choice. It is my choice as to whether I'm going to hold on to my anger and my resentment or whether I'm going to let it go. I can't control other people's actions. I can't control other people's words. I can't control how other people choose to treat me, but I can control how I react to those things. I can't control how I react when I'm hurt, and I can't control how I react when I'm mistreated and when I've been wronged and when people that I care about have been treated in, in an awful way. I can control that. That is my choice. So we just looked a second ago at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 31. The next verse, in verse 32, Paul says this. We get rid of bitterness, get rid of resentment and anger. And then he says this in verse 32. If we're getting rid of all that stuff, here's what we need to do. We need to be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. It's my choice. How I'm going to react when someone hurts me. My God says I need to choose to forgive. That's the choice I need to make. Choose to forgive. And number two, man, let it go. Let go of the hurt. Easier said than done, I know. But we got to let it go. I can't be healed from it. I can't move past it. I can't truly forgive you of it if I still hold on to it. If I keep reminding myself of the hurt, if I, if I keep holding on to the anger and the frustration because of some action that you took or some words that you said, then it won't heal, and I can't forgive. I've got to let it go. I've got to quit bringing it up. I've got to quit holding it over your head. I've got to quit talking to other people about it. I've got to quit focusing on it myself. I've got to let it go. Back in the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah, hundreds of years before Jesus was on this earth, God spoke through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 43 and verse 18 and says, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. It's not, we're, I, I'm not challenging you to pretend bad things never happened. I'm not asking you to, to pretend that, that somebody didn't hurt you. That somebody didn't say something awful to you. That somebody didn't do something mean to somebody that you care about. We're not pretending those things didn't happen. We're letting go of those things. We're not dwelling on them. We're not living in the past. We're not dwelling on the mistake. We're choosing to let it go so that we can truly forgive it. Folks, that's my only two action steps to give you today. Make the choice to forgive. And in that process, to truly forgive that other person you got to let it go. you got to let it go. We need to be cheerful givers. We need to be cheerful forgivers. There's a story told in, uh, in John chapter 13. It's the night before Jesus, well, the night of Jesus' arrest. He's with his disciples. He's, he's in this room. He's sharing with them some things that, that are on his heart that he hasn't shared with them yet. In a few hours, he's going to be arrested, and he's going to be put through this mock trial. He's going to be beaten almost to death, and then he's going to be crucified. And the tradition of his culture at that time was when you walked in the door, a household servant, or if there wasn't a household servant available, the, the kind of the lowest person on the totem pole, the, 
the least popular person in the room, would wash everybody else's feet. You walked around in sandals or barefoot all day. And so whatever dust and animal stuff you had walked through has now caked on your feet. And when you eat a meal, not at tables and chairs, but laying on cushions with your feet possibly in somebody else's face, you want those feet washed, right? The meal had already been served and nobody had washed anybody's feet. There wasn't a household servant to do it. And all the disciples of Jesus were sitting around going, well, who's going to wash feet? I'm not going to. That's not my job. Everybody had the same attitude. Until Jesus got up. And he went over into the corner and he got a bowl of water. And he walked around one by one and he knelt down. And he began washing all that junk off of his disciples' feet. And I want you to understand, sometimes we, when we look at foot washing, we're like, oh, just, you know, splash some water on it and let it rinse off and that'll be fine. This stuff is probably caked on by the end of the day. You don't just pour some water on it and that's it. You got to dig in a little bit, wipe that stuff off. And he goes around the room and he washes every single one of his disciples' feet. And he goes back and he puts the bowl of water back over in the corner. And then he turns to his disciples. And you can find it in John chapter 13. He turns to them and he says, what I just did, you need to do for each other. And there's so many, so many uh, ramifications of what that statement means. Let me give you a little bit different perspective on it this morning. Jesus was washing all that junk off of his disciples. I don't have the ability to remove your sins. I don't have that power. I don't have that authority. My God does. And through the blood of Jesus, he does it. But here's what I can do. Whatever it is between you and me, whatever words have been spoken, whatever actions have been taken that has caused some kind of problem between us, whatever that junk is, I can be the one to step forward and wash that off. I can choose to forgive whatever it is between you and me. Whatever those hurt feelings are, whatever, however many days, weeks, months, years it has been, I can be the one to step forward and say, let's be done with this. Let me get rid of the resentment. Let me get rid of the anger. Let me get rid of the guilt. Let's be done. Let's let this connection, this relationship be clean. Can we do that? That's what Jesus said we need to do. What you have seen me do, you need to do for each other. Whatever the muck is that has gotten between us, I'll be the one to step forward and wash it away. If you are here this morning and someone who claims to be a follower of Jesus has mistreated you in some way, has not been the kind of person that they should have been towards you. For what it's worth, I'm sorry. If you're here this morning and maybe you mistreated somebody else and they claim to be Christians, but they are holding that over your head, they haven't forgiven you, they've held on to that bitterness and that resentment and that anger. For what it's worth, I'm sorry. We're going to try as a church family, aren't we? To be cheerful forgivers. It can start with us. It can start right now. We're going to stand together in just a moment. We're going to sing a song about the amazing grace, the amazing love of our Father. How much He has forgiven us, how much He has washed away from us. And I would challenge you, as we're singing that song, if you have not allowed Jesus Christ to wash away all that junk in your life, let him do it today. Come forward while we sing and, and, and say, I'm ready to give my life to him. I'm ready to have a new start. I'm ready to be washed clean. We'll help make that happen. If there's something between you and somebody else, there's something that you've been holding on to, there's some kind of junk between the two of you, I would challenge you. I would encourage you. If you want to share that with us, there is no judgment here. We will pray for you. We will pray that God will set you free from that burden so that you can forgive them.
Let's be cheerful forgivers. Let's be reminded of what we've been forgiven of. Let's celebrate that together while we stand and sing. If you have a need, let us help.